This evening, this morning, we read the Word of God as we find it in 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Paul to Timothy, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between men, between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. I will, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness, with good works. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. May God bless our reading of his holy word. In the four, fifth and sixth verses, fifth and sixth verses of 1 Timothy 2, we read, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Quickly, the for all, of course, as you know, can, can see from verse 4, is all kinds, all kinds of men. Those to whom Timothy was ministering didn't believe, believe that it, God would never want to save a king or one in authority. But Paul has this, Timothy teach the people to pray for kings, to pray for all in authority, because God will have even them to be saved too, all kinds of men to be saved. Notice also, by the way, since you still have your Bibles open, that in the 16th verse of the third chapter, we read this. Let's read 15 with it. 1 Timothy 3, 15 and 16. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth, and without controversy. Here it is. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. We'll make specific reference to that passage later in the course of the sermon. But we use this, especially that which we find in verse 5 of 1 Timothy chapter 2, to show to us what we want to learn from Lord's Day 6. Lord's Day 6. Remember that the last question and answer of the previous Lord's Day, Lord's Day 5, answered the general question, what kind of mediator 
or deliverer do we look for? Three things. One who is very man. Two, a perfectly righteous man. And three, yet more powerful than all creatures, that is, one who is also very God. So three things. Man, perfectly righteous man, and very God. Now, is there any that can do that and be that kind of a mediator? Lord's Day 6 deals with that. But it jumps first from that general question. Why must answering the questions of, of question and answer 15, why must he be very man and also perfectly righteous? Because the justice of God requires that the same human nature which hath sinned should likewise make satisfaction for sin. Why perfectly righteous? Because one who is himself a sinner cannot satisfy for others. Then the third requirement must be very God. Why? Answer, that he might, by the power of his Godhead, sustain in his human nature the burden of God's wrath, and, at the same time, might obtain for and restore to us righteousness and life. Next question and answer. Is there anyone who can have all of those? Answer to all of you, even to the children, is obvious. Who then is that mediator who in one person is both very God and real righteous man? Our Lord Jesus Christ. And now a quote from 1 Corinthians 1.30. Who of God, don't slip past those first little words, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Then this. How do you know this? Whence knowest thou this? From the Holy Gospel, which God himself first revealed in paradise, afterwards published by the patriarchs and prophets, and represented by the sacrifices and other ceremonies of the law, and lastly has fulfilled it by his only begotten Son. Where we're going to end this sermon is that gospel is what must be believed. Sure, you can have a gospel proclaim something, give you a message. But the calling is that we have to believe that which is preached to us, the Holy Gospel. And that's going to take us to the next Lord's Day. And that is, what's faith? What is this belief? So, this morning, we still look at that subject and that concept about a mediator. First, rather generally, what must he be? We're going to answer those questions. Why must he be really man, a perfectly righteous man, and a real God, very God? Then, we'll face the question that's answered in, Lord's, in question and answer 18. Who is, who is he? Is there one like that, that has those things? And then finally, we're going to face that last question and answer, how is he known in the Holy Gospel? Notice, it doesn't say in the Scriptures. The Scriptures contain the Gospel. The Gospel didn't need the Scriptures. The Gospel was first proclaimed in the Garden of Eden, in Paradise. It was proclaimed before there was even any page of the Bible written. So we're looking for the gospel. Now, go back. What kind of a mediator do we need? Again, let's remember what is a mediator. A mediator is someone, a third party, who comes in between two differing parties. Both of them have to have some confidence that he's going to represent them fairly. 
But at the same time, both of them are going to be suspicious of him. Is he really going to do a good job, or is he going to be more fair to the other party? So the mediator has got to come in between these two parties that are at odds with each other, that are at war with each other, that differ with each other. He's got to get both of them to make certain concessions so that there can be a sense of peace, reconciliation. That's what a mediator usually does. That's the way we understand that. The mediator that we're looking for, as the Catechism has led us into this consideration of a mediator, is someone who's very, very special, a special kind of mediator, and that for three reasons. The first reason, very un well and easily understood, is that whereas usually two parties who have been together now are at odds and got to be brought back together, when we talk about a mediator who becomes, comes between, verse 5, God and us, God never made a change. God doesn't have to make some concessions. God never fell away. God never has to say, oh, I'm sorry, I said that. Or I did that. God doesn't need to repent of things that he's done against us. God does not have to change. That first. Secondly, Whereas in the realm of our life, a mediator usually is a third party that's been chosen by someone else to get these two to agree. The mediator that we're looking for is a mediator who came from God himself. One of the parties provided the mediator. And that's the significance of the catechism quoting 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30 in question and answer 18. He is, now you have just two little words, but they're very significant. He is of God. He is of God. He came from God. So the first reason why this is a special mediator is because in his mediating work, God doesn't have to change. The second reason he is special is because God himself provided the mediator. And then, thirdly, that mediator must so represent us that he actually, he, the mediator, makes the satisfaction for us. See, usually a mediator comes in between and he makes the two parties make sacrifices. Here, the mediator himself makes the satisfaction for us to bring us into reconciliation with God. So a very special concept of mediation has to be understood. He has to be very man. Let's just quickly review those three things. He has to be true human. He has to be like us in all things. He has to have a very real human nature. He has to be human in his body. He has to be human in his soul. He can't be part human, just in his body, but not in his soul. He has to be human inside and out. Completely human. He must be like us in all things. That's the language of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Sin accepted. But like us in all things. Very God. I'm sorry, really man. Two, he has to be perfectly righteous. 
He has to be without any sin that he's inherited from Adam, and he has to be without actual sins and sinfulness in himself and on his part. He can't have sin that he's first got to make satisfaction for, for himself and then for others. The priests had to do that. In the old dispensation, the priests, when they performed their work, couldn't just march in and say, okay, we'll take care of the sins of the people. No, first they had to go through sacrifices and washings for themselves because they were sinners. So they're first working to take care of themselves, and then they represent the people. The mediator we need can't have anything that he has to pay for himself. The question is asked, why must he be very righteous? Because he himself, as a sinner, can't make satisfaction for others. So he's got to be human, like us in all things. He has to be a perfectly righteous human, and then thirdly, he has to be very God. And he has to be very God for three reasons. First, only God can sustain, can endure God's wrath. He has to be very God first because he has to endure divine wrath infinitely, infinite wrath. He has to be able to take and endure all of the great burden of God's wrath. He's got to be God. Two, no human would accept that responsibility and keep accepting it willingly, voluntarily. We might wish we could. We might think we could start doing it willingly. I'll substitute for them. But then when the heat of that wrath comes on it, on a, we would want to escape. We want to jump out of it. Only someone who is God can willingly and voluntarily give himself so that he doesn't have his life taken from him, but he gives his life to God. Only God can do that. And the third reason he must be very God is because that which he has to earn for us is so fantastically great. Though it did not happen that Adam did not sin, Adam, if he didn't sin, would never go to heaven. He'd always be on earth. And Adam would always need that tree of life. Something in the fruit of that tree, in distinction from all the other trees, he would need that tree of life to continue an earthly life. Our mediator must be divine because that which he has to earn is one life an everlasting life. Life, what, really what is life? Usually we think of continuation. No, 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 no. John 17, 3. Life is knowing God. This is eternal life, that they might know thee in Jesus Christ whom he has sent. So life, real life, I'm not really alive unless I know God. And Jesus, the mediator that we're looking for, has to be God because he's got to earn for us that kind of a life, that life that enables us to know God. And then, on top of it, an everlasting life. 
Only the infinite God can provide everlasting life for those that he represents. Is there such? Now the answer we all know, but let's not quickly rush there. To be completely human, to be completely God, and to be a human who is perfectly righteous. We have to see that from our perspective, totally impossible. Let's not quickly rush because then we're not going to have that broken heart and contrite spirit. Let's not go there so boldly. Let's be so overwhelmed that God provides something that we cannot. One of the parties, the one that doesn't need to be reconciled, we need to be reconciled to him. He doesn't need to be reconciled to us. We need to be brought back up. He never did anything. So it's not, remember in that Christmas hymn, the word, we, we sometimes change the words when we sing it. It's not God and man reconciled. It's God with man reconciled. God's got to bring us to him. He never changed. Is there such? Nothing that we can ever provide. So God's got to provide the mediator. And that one he did, who is our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why our text puts it that way. There is one God and one mediator between God and men. The man, Christ Jesus, who, now look there in verse 16 of chapter 3, is God manifest in our flesh. God in our flesh manifested. And only God in our flesh could do what verse 6 of chapter 2 says, gave himself a ransom for all, for all kinds, remember, for all kinds, which is now testified in the gospel in due time. So one more time, at the risk of repetition, but to make the point very, very clearly. The mediator is provided by God himself. He's not the product of something man did and God did. Even in his conception, what did Mary provide? Mary didn't provide something. The power of the highest overshadowed her. The power of the highest implanted that divine sperm that God provided through her in that egg. He provided the conception. God and man. No father, a virgin, an impossibility for every human perspective. A virgin conceived can't be, but a virgin conceived. God himself, by himself. God showed that in the familiar event that's recorded in Genesis 15 when God came to Abram and said, I'm going to make a covenant between you and me. And then God had Abram do the normal practice about how a covenant would be made in those days. Cut up certain animals, make two rows, and then the two who were going to be joined together in this agreement would walk between the two rows. Well, you all know 
Only God has a burning and smoking furnace went through. Abram didn't go through those two. He didn't make that agreement with God. God established the covenant with Abram. The mediator does not come into being by an activity of God and us. So again, 1 Corinthians 1.30 reads this way. Who of God and man? No. Who of God and of God alone is made unto us wisdom and righteousness, sanctification and redemption. And then those familiar words from 2 Corinthians 5. God was in Christ reconciling us to himself. He reconciled us to himself. God was in Christ. Now, Jesus Christ, the one that we know as he's revealed to us in the scriptures, in the gospel, has those three qualifications. One, he is completely man. In Hebrews chapter 2, for as much, verse 14, as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he himself also likewise took part of the same. He took part of flesh and blood that through death he might destroy him that had power of the death, that namely that is the devil, and deliver them who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. He did not take unto himself the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. He became like us. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. Hebrews chapter 2. The mediator. Jesus Christ is totally like us. Some powerful verses that highlight that concept. The first one that I would like to point out is Mark 1, verse 41. There was a leper that stood in front of Christ beseeching him and he knelt down before Christ and he said unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. The humanity, the complete full humanity of Jesus is evidenced in this. Jesus moved with compassion. He was moved with compassion. Listen to this. Maybe you want to mark this in your Bibles. Tucked away in Isaiah 63, verse 9. In our affliction, he was afflicted. No matter what you've gone through, no matter what you are experiencing or will. Know this truth. Isaiah 63, verse 9. In our affliction, he was afflicted. He hurts. He suffers long. In order to do that, he has to be himself very man. At the same time, he has to be free from our sinfulness. And now we're going to understand that that's why Jesus was born of a virgin. The sinfulness of Adam. The 
that comes to us, comes to us in two ways. Legally is guilt, because Adam is our representative head. And experientially and conditionally, as corruption, because Adam is our first father. How is it that Jesus could be really man, but without Adam's sin? The first reason? Legally. While Jesus is completely human, body and soul, his person, his person is divine. Adam is the representative head, and the guilt of Adam passes from Adam to everyone that he represents, to every person that he represents. The human Adam represents every human person. Jesus is human, but without a human person. He has a divine person. He is God. He is the second person of the Trinity in flesh. God the Son. So thus, Jesus avoided the guilt of Adam, original guilt. He did not have a human person, a divine person. He had a divine one, not a human. Second, he avoided the corruption that comes from Adam in original sin. Original guilt, original sin consists of original guilt and original corruption. No guilt because he had a divine person. No corruption because Jesus did not have a human father. Adam's corruption goes from Adam to his son and then through that father to the next son to the next son, to the next son, all the way to all of us. When I look at the corruption of my children, it all started with me, not Sue, me. Adam's corruption comes right through me. I give it to them. So I can't scratch my head and say, why are you kids so without knowing? Yep. They got it from me. Jesus had a divine father. And as that divine father, he could be born a sinless man, perfectly righteous in his beginning and perfectly righteous throughout all of his life. So, truly man, like us in all things, afflicted with our affliction, he could have compassion, he sighed. Perfectly righteous, avoided all of Adam's corruption and guilt. And very God. Very God. That's the point of that 16th verse of 1 Timothy 3. God was manifest in the flesh. None other than the second person of the triune Godhead. And that divine nature, which belongs to that second person, the divine nature had no beginning. That divine nature that has been eternally his is what sustained and strengthened that human nature that he took on himself when conceived in the womb of Mary. But that divine nature so sustained that human nature, that weakened human nature, that he was able to die, able to suffer actively and willingly, able to love God perfectly. The divine sustained the human, the weakened human. Now the Lord has given to us, the church of the 21st century, the privilege of standing on the shoulders of the churches of every century before. 
who, led by the Spirit, as they studied the Scriptures, have been able to gather out of the Scriptures what they teach about this mediator and about this one whom we call our Lord Jesus Christ. Early until 451, early the history of the church, there were constant struggles. Who is this Lord Jesus Christ? Arius, the father of Arianism, said, Jesus is the greatest creation of God, but he's not man, but he's not God. He's the greatest create creature, but he's not God. He's God like, but he's not the same as God. That was Arius. The other extreme. It's called Apollinarianism. Jesus was God, but he wasn't fully human. So they denied that he had a full, complete human nature. Nestorianism. Something that you, little names that you're going to kind of remember from church history classes. Nestorianism. Two natures, but two persons. Not one person. Two persons, a divine person, a divine eye, and a human eye in Christ. So they denied the oneness of the person of Jesus Christ. And then finally, Eutychianism. Eutychianism said divine, human, and you put them together and you get a, a mixture, and, and they're really not the same as what they were. It's like taking water and flour and you put them together and they make a third thing. You take the divine, you take the human, you put them together and you get a third. That was Eutychianism. Now over against that, the church of the past has helped tremendously. Follow with me, first of all, in the Belgian Confession on page 44. In Article 19, in Article 18, it talks about how Jesus is conceived in the womb of Mary. And it's of the fruit of the womb of Mary, made of the seed of David according to the flesh, made of a woman, a branch of David, a shoot of the root of Jesse, sprung up from the tribe of Judah, descended from the Jews according to the flesh of the seed of Abraham. Hence, since he took on him the seed of Abraham, made like unto his brethren in all things sin accepted. That's Article 18. Now, Article 19. The union and the distinction of these two natures, divine and human. We believe that by this conception, in the womb of Mary, the person, one person, not two, one, the person of the Son is inseparably united and connected with the human nature so that there are not two sons of God, nor two persons, but rather two natures united in one single person. Yet that each nature, the divine and the human, retains its own distinct properties. The human remains human, the divine remains human. As then the divine nature hath also remained uncreated. It never was, had a beginning. The divine nature is without the beginning of days or end of life. The divine nature, here's listen to this, fills heaven and earth. It keeps its own properties. So also the human nature keeps its own properties. Hasn't lost it. He remains a creature. He has beginning of days. He is of a finite nature and retains all the properties of a real body. And though there was no ch and no and no change was made in the human nature of Jesus, still human after his resurrection, the kids often think that, get that confused in catechism. He was man, man, and then when he arose from the dead and he ascended into heaven, he stopped being human. No, he seated at the right hand of God is our human nature. 
though he hath by his resurrection given immortality to that same human nature, nevertheless he hath not changed the reality of his human nature, for as much as our salvation and resurrection also depend upon the reality of his body. These two natures are so closely united in that one person that they were not separated even by his death. The divine and human weren't separated even by his death. His body was put in the grave. His human soul, human soul, he went, went to heaven. Therefore, that which he, when dying, commended into the hands of his father was his real human spirit departing from his body. But in the meantime, the divine nature always remained united with the human, even when he lay in the grave. And the Godhead did not cease to be in him any more than it did when he was an infant, though it did not so clearly manifest itself for a while. You couldn't see that he was divine when he was a baby. Wherefore, we confess that he is very God and very man, very God in his power to conquer death, and very man that he might die for us according to the infirmity, the weakness of his flesh. Don't close. Now I'll go to page 84. 84. Creed of Chalcedon. 451. The church talked about these two natures. And this is what they said about him. We then, following, the, right at the bottom, bottom of the page, following the Holy Fathers, all with one consent, teach men to confess one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the same perfect in Godhead and also perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man, of a rational soul and body, co-essential with the Father according to the Godhead, and consubstantial with us, according to the manhood, in all things like unto us, but without sin, begotten before all ages of the Father according to his Godhead, and in these last days, for us and our salvation, was begotten in the womb of Mary, born of a virgin Mary, the mother of God, according to his manhood. One and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, to be acknowledged in two natures. And now look at the italics. This is what they added in 451. Those two natures are without confusion. They're without change. They're without division. They are without separation. Talk about that just quickly. Without confusion. The full divine is united with the full human. Don't think of a pie. Two pies. We'll cut it in half. We'll take this half and this half and we'll put them together. So you got half of each. No. Jesus' two natures were without division. The full human and the full divine were put together in him. Without change. They always remained the same. They didn't change in any sense when they came together. Without mixture. It didn't become a combination, a confusion. And without separation, once they were put together, they're never separated again. So when he was in the grave, when he was in heaven... And right now, those two, human, those two natures, divine and human in Christ, are forever. You know, and here's the practical part, and I love the way the Belgian Confession ends that way. He's God. Sometimes the devil so works in us that he makes us think that our sins are so great that they can't be forgiven. Who could be, who could do what I did? Who could think what I did? Who could be so evil as I, so confused, so sinful, and, and, and be saved? The Savior 
is really human, but he's also very God. And that's why grace is greater than all our sin. Sin abounds, grace doth much more abound, because the Savior you have is so God that in his death he could pay for every dastardly deed. I never want to minimize the horribleness of our sins. But we want to maximize how great a Savior you have because he's God. But so human. So human that in all our pain, all our suffering, all our hurt, he knows. Not just pain in body. His shame, there he hung naked. Pain in his mind, his brethren rejected him and contradicted him. He understands. He knows. Sometimes we think we have to defend ourselves against them because they don't get it. No, if we would just quickly suddenly remember, wait a minute, I have someone who does understand. And then go back to Isaiah 63, verse 9. In all our affliction, he was afflicted. God provided the mediator. How do we know that? Well, that's exactly what the gospel is. The gospel is the declaration to us that God has provided that kind of Savior, really God, but really man, and a perfectly righteous man. That's something that God proclaimed in the protoevangel, the prototype of the gospel, evangel, good news. The prototype, protoevangel, was Genesis 3, verse 15. There will be a seed of the woman who's going to crush the head of the seed of the serpent. And then in visions and in prophecies, God gave it to the patriarchs. He expanded on it and defined this gospel more and more clearly in the law and in the commandments. And then to the prophets, it became more clear. And then suddenly, God revealed that mediator in all of his glory. But he retains the knowledge of that in the scriptures, so that in the scriptures, we have that protoevangel, we have those visions, we have those prophecies, we have the declaration and description of the mediator as God gave him, we have the explanation of that in the epistles, and God gives to us in the inspired scriptures the gospel. And it's the gospel that we have to believe. Once again, don't ever believe a human. Don't ever say, I'm going to follow so-and-so. I'm a disciple of H.H. H. or of John Calvin. No. They're men. The truth that God used them to communicate was only because they revealed and spoke of what God has revealed in the scriptures, the strength of any man's speech is only good insofar as it explains and presents what God says in his word. And now God elevates that and he says, yes, it's in the scriptures, but now I'm going to use, and this is what he's done throughout all of history and now especially in this dispensation, I'm going to use, men call it foolish, but I, I'm wise. I'm going to call it the preaching of the gospel to be the power that I'm going to use to save. Men may seek a sign. 
They may seek after wisdom, but I'm going to use the weakest means of preaching to be my power to save. I'm going to give and communicate grace. I can use communicate grace to my people in all different kinds of ways. I am able. But God says to us, the chief way I'm going to communicate grace to my people is by gathering, having them gather together under the preaching of the gospel. I'm going to proclaim to them the truth. I'm going to remind them and teach them over and over through the weakest means. They may call it weak, but to me, it's the wisdom and the power of God. 1 Corinthians 1. Now, when we hear that, now we're jumping ahead to next week, Lord's Day 7. That's what we, having been given the power of faith, have to exercise that faith to take a hold of that truth. And that's what's so serious when we say, well, I don't need the preaching. The elders in the church consistently say, you are avoiding the means of grace. Why do you want to skip what God says is the way he's going to show to you this gospel of Christ? It's essential. It's absolutely necessary that you hear Christ proclaim His work to save you. Do you believe? Children, what about you? This is not just for dads and moms. This is for young people. This is for every age child. Do you believe? Believe the gospel, the good news that God has provided the only possible mediator, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We thank thee, Father, for this word. Well dost thou provide, guiding us, using the church of the past. We're so thankful, Father, that, that we have creeds that we don't tuck away and forget but that we could bring out and look at again and again and again and read over and over in order to see what thou didst by thy spirit lead the church of the past to present out of thy word to be the truth. And we believe and thank thee, Father, that, that those creeds are from thy word. In fact, they quote over and over from thy word. And we thank thee that we can see that and it's obvious to us that they're not just the thoughts of other men, but they are the presentation of the truth of thy word. May they be fresh and blessed truths that comfort us, that sinners though we are, with thee there is forgiveness. For Jesus' sake, amen.